Hello everyone, and welcome back to History Made Easy. In the last episode, we discussed William the Conqueror and his journey through England in the 1066 Norman Conquest of England. In today's episode, we are going to be talking about the Norman invasion of Ireland and the role the two castles in particular played throughout it. This is History Made Easy, the Norman period. In 1066, the Normans invaded England, as you know, William the Conqueror. But it was another 27 years before they finally invaded Wales. They obviously made various incursions into Wales to spy out the land, but they're too busy getting England under control. But then in 1093, it all changes for Wales. A man named Roger de Montgomery, the great Earl of Shrewsbury, the second most powerful man in Britain after King William I, decided it was time for him to invade. And he came into Wales with his son, youngest son, Arnold, and they arrived here at Pembroke in the year 1093. So what happens is Roger goes on and leaves his son Arnold to build a castle at Pembroke, the very first one. And at the western tip, it was a natural place to put the defensive castle. There was already most certainly a ditch, perhaps an Iron Age ditch there. And the Normans took that and deepened it to a depth of 10 meters, running across the peninsula from north to south. And then they erected a wooden castle first, creating a wooden wall across the peninsula in which there was a gatehouse. And inside the castle itself, there was a Norman wooden hall where they sat and lived, stables, ancillary buildings, and of course, a well. And that was the very first castle at Pembroke in the year 1093, built by Arnulf de Montgomery. There were two members of the de Clare family in this story. One was Gilbert, the other one was his son Richard. Gilbert de Clare was known as Strongbow as a result of his ruling over the lands of Strangbow. Later, his son Richard de Clare would go on to inherit this name despite not using the title himself. Gilbert de Clare was already a very rich man. He'd come across with William the Conqueror, had lands and titles. He was made the Earl of Pembroke to control the West End of Wales and he was given the title of Earl by King Stephen. Over the following years, Richard de Clare demonstrated to King Stephen that he wasn't loyal to him by offering support to Empress Matilda, a woman who, at the time, possessed a greater claim to the throne of England than King Stephen did. And when Gilbert died, 1148 and his son Richard de Clare assumed to have taken the, the earldom of Pembrokeshire. That's not the case because King Stephen no longer trusted the de Clares and he did not confirm the appointment of, of Richard to the earldom of Pembroke. And eventually Richard had his estates taken away from him because he offended the king mightily. Over in Ireland, Dermot McMorrow had recently become king of the province of Leinster following the sudden death of his older brother. So Dermot was the chief or king of Leinster and he was continually feuding against the surrounding lands um, of Breffney and Ossery, but he also had the support of the North men. He was just trying to hold on to his land, i.e. Leinster, and gain some extra land. And they didn't like him. He wasn't a very likable man, apparently. Ruler of one of the surrounding islands, Tiernan O'Rourke, wanted to stop McMorrow from gaining more land. O'Rourke slaughtered much of the livestock in Leinster to cause a famine in the area and ruin McMorrow's reputation. In 1152, McMorrow took O'Rourke's wife to the Rock of Donna Mays. Dermot McMorrow and Tiernan O'Rourke's wife is called a kidnapping, but there's actually an argument or discussion for whether she was kidnapped or whether she went willingly. Apparently, there are letters going between the two leading up to said kidnapping, but it wasn't very romantic because she left without her dowry, i.e. she left without any animals, um, furniture, monies, a dowry, and she left with nothing. He had people on his side until that moment. He crossed the line. O'Rourke's wife and McMorrow stayed together on the Rock of Donna Mays for three years until O'Rourke, along with his ally O'Connor, launched an attack on McMorrow's land and took her back to Brienne. 
After this incident, McMorrow's crown was taken off him and he was forced to flee Ireland in 1166. Rather than sit and do nothing, Dermot immediately travelled across to France to meet with his friend and ally, King Henry II. They'd worked together previously and he said to the king, would you please help me to restore me to my throne? To which Henry II said, I can't, I'm too busy here in France, but I'll give you a letter, a license, that you can seek help from any of the Lord's Earls in England and Wales. They may well help you. And that's exactly what Dermot did. Now, when Richard de Clare heard of this, having been stripped of his lands and titles, he thought it is a golden opportunity to restore my fortunes, my titles. So he immediately offers help to King Dermot, and they plan the invasion of Ireland. With the help of Robert Fitzstephen and Maurice Fitzgerald, Richard de Clare raised an army of around 700 men, and within two days, they had successfully invaded the Irish town of Wexford. After Wexford was claimed, Richard grew his army to contain over 1,200 men and prepared to invade the towns of Waterford and Dublin. They set sail from Pembroke Castle, in fact, on the river below the river Pembroke, and they arrived near Waterford at a place called Passage, and very quickly took Waterford and Dublin. So now they had Wexford, Waterford and Dublin, and things were really beginning to get established for the Normans. The moment they arrived in Waterford, the king kept one of his two promises that he'd made to Richard Strongbow. First, he would make Strongbow his heir as the king of Leinster, and secondly, give him his daughter's hand in marriage, an Irish princess called Aoife, which in English is Eve, and indeed, immediately they arrived in Waterford, Richard and Aoife were married. The Rock of Donna Mays was given to Richard as part of his dowry with Aoife. Richard immediately had a wooden keep built on top of the site. Dermot Moira, the King of Leinster, in 1171 died, and immediately Richard Strongbow declared himself to be the King of Leinster, which was to make of his children princes and princesses of Ireland. In 1171, Richard is now the King of Leinster. He owns vast tracts of land, controls huge territories, and is getting too powerful for the liking of Henry II. And so Henry II decides to visit Ireland himself with his own armies. And when he arrives in 1171, puts all his own men into Waterford, Dublin and Wexford, but retains Richard as the Lord Justiciar of Ireland. In other words, Richard is the king's man in Ireland from this point on. In 1176, Richard Strongbow dies. When he dies, he leaves two children, a minor called Gilbert. Gilbert too dies, unfortunately. He would have inherited his father's estates, but they passed to his second child, a daughter called Princess Isabella. As far as we're concerned here in Pembrokeshire, Lady Isabella was the second Countess of Pembroke because there's no evidence of Richard ever being given the titles of Pembroke. He certainly therefore could not have passed them on to his son, Gilbert, who is in fact shown as the third Earl of Pembroke. And the King, Henry, gave all the titles to Isabella. When Richard Strongbow died, Isabella was taken into the wardship of King Henry II, and she had to be taken from Pembroke over to London when she sailed across from Ireland. And the job was given to Sir William Marshall, and he escorted the now beautiful young woman from Pembrokeshire to London and fell in love with her. And as soon as he could, he asked her hand in marriage from her ward, the king himself. And the king, Henry II, said, yes, but not yet, but I will definitely give her to you in marriage. Unfortunately, he died before that could happen. But fortunately for William, the successor was King Richard I, the eldest son of King Henry. And Richard kept the promise that his father had made and gave beautiful Isabella in marriage to William Marshall. William and Isabel arrived at Pembroke to find Arnold's wooden castle still standing proud. Marshall came prepared, he'd laid out his plans, and his stonemasons came with him, and he gave them instructions to build exactly what he wanted. First of all, they replaced the wooden wall with a huge defensive stone wall. The ditch is there, the 30, 30 feet, 10 meter ditch is still in front of it. And then they build a great gatehouse in that great wall, and inside that, they build a great tall tower called the Keep Today, but probably called a donjon. It's a round tower with a dome roof. When it was built, it stood 28 meters high. They added the defences of Pembrokeshire by building another 50 castles in a 40 mile radius of Pembroke Castle. They were all Mott and Bailey castles, initially built with a wooden tower on a mound, but most are now just either mounds of earth or depressions. We found 49 of the 50 so far. Nowadays, Pembroke is still one of the largest privately owned castles in Wales. 
The title of the Earl of Pembroke went on to become extinct and be recreated a total of 10 times throughout history. In the next episode, we will be going to Scotland to learn about William the Lion and his connection to Arnick Castle. <laughs>